May 29th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Kings chapter 11 from the Old Testament. King Solomon fell in love with many foreign women, besides Pharaoh's daughter, including Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They came from nations about which the Lord had warned the Israelites, you must not establish friendly relations with them. If you do, they will surely shift your allegiance to their gods. But Solomon was irresistibly attracted to them. He had 700 royal wives and 300 concubines. His wives had a powerful influence over him. When Solomon became old, his wives shifted his allegiance to other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped the Sidonian goddess Astarte and the detestable Ammonite god Milcom. Solomon did evil in the Lord's sight. He did not remain loyal to the Lord like his father David had. Furthermore, on the hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for the detestable Moabite god Chemosh and for the detestable Ammonite god Milcom. He built high places for all his foreign wives so they could burn incense and make sacrifices to their gods. The Lord was angry with Solomon because he had shifted his allegiance away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him on two occasions and had warned him about this very thing so that he would not follow other gods. But he did not obey the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you insist on doing these things, and have not kept the covenantal rules I gave you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. However, for your father's David's sake, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will tear it away from your son's hand instead. But I will not tear away the entire kingdom. I will leave your son one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for the sake of my chosen city, Jerusalem. The Lord brought against Solomon an enemy, Hadad the Edomite, a descendant of the Edomite king. During David's campaign against Edom, Joab, the commander of the army, while on a mission to bury the dead, killed every male in Edom. For six months, Joab and the entire Israelite army stayed there until they had exterminated every male in Edom. Hadad, who was only a small boy at the time, escaped with some of his father's Edomite servants and headed for Egypt. They went from Midian to Paran. They took some men from Paran and went to Egypt. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, supplied him with a house and food and even assigned him some land. Pharaoh liked Hadad so well, he gave him his sister-in-law, Queen Topani's sister, as a wife. Topani's sister gave birth to his son, named Ganubath. Topani's raised him in Pharaoh's palace. Ganubath grew up in Pharaoh's palace among Pharaoh's sons. While in Egypt, Hadad heard that David had passed away and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead. So Hadad asked Pharaoh, Give me permission to leave so I can return to my homeland. Pharaoh said to him, What do you lack here that makes you want to go to your homeland? Hadad replied, Nothing, but please give me permission to leave. God also brought against Solomon another enemy, Rezan, son of Eliada, who had run away from his master, King Hadadezer of Zobah. He gathered some men and organized a raiding band. When David tried to kill them, they went to Damascus, where they settled down and gained control of the city. He was Israel's enemy throughout Solomon's reign and, like Hadad, caused trouble. He loathed Israel and ruled over Syria. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, one of Solomon's servants, rebelled against the king. He was an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother was a widow named Zeruiah. This is what prompted him to rebel against the king. Solomon built a terrace and he closed up a gap in the wall of the city of his father David. Jeroboam was a talented man. When Solomon saw that the young man was an accomplished worker, He made him the leader of the work crew from the tribe of Joseph. At that time, when Jeroboam had left Jerusalem, the prophet Elijah, the Shilonite, met him on the road. 
The two of them were alone in the open country. Elijah was wearing a brand new robe and he grabbed the robe and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he told Jeroboam, take 10 pieces, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Look, I'm about to tear the kingdom from Solomon's hand and I will give 10 tribes to you. He will retain one tribe for my servant David's sake and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. I am taking the kingdom from him because they have abandoned me and worship the Sidonian goddess Astarte, the Moabite god Chemosh, and the Ammonite god Milcom. They have not followed my instructions by doing what I approve and obeying my rules and regulations like Solomon's father David did. I will not take the whole kingdom from his hand. I will allow him to be ruler for the rest of his life. For the sake of my chosen servant David, who kept my commandments and rules, I will take the kingdom from the hand of his son and give ten tribes to you. I will leave his son one tribe so my servant David's dynasty may continue to serve me in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen as my home. I will select you. You will rule over all you desire to have and you will be king over Israel. You must obey all I command you to do, follow my instructions, do what I approve, and keep my rules and commandments like my servant David did. Then I will be with you and establish for you a lasting dynasty as I did for David. I will give you Israel. I will humiliate David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam escaped to Egypt and found refuge with King Shishak of Egypt. He stayed in Egypt until Solomon died. The rest of the events of Solomon's reign, including all his accomplishments and his wise decisions, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of Solomon. Solomon ruled over all Israel from Jerusalem for 40 years. Then Solomon passed away and was buried in the city of his father David. His son, Rehoboam, replaced him as king. God, seriously? 700 wives and 300 concubines. I, I don't know how the man even made any wise decisions. That, did, that doesn't even make sense. A thousand women? Uh, and if they all worshipped other gods, of course they turned his head. But for somebody who was the wisest man in the entire world, to make that choice to allow those women to turn his head is astounding. So I think about, about our lives. That here's Solomon, the wisest man in the world. And his faith from somebody he loves very, very much you can tell that he just has a heart for you, God, throughout some of these beginning stories. How these women shifted his focus, shifted his allegiance, shifted his faith to these gods that didn't even exist. And I think about our lives and how our media shifts our attention away from you. Our social interactions shift our attention away from you, our desires and wants and work and titles and cars and vacations shift our attention away from you. So God, today I come before you and I ask for, I ask for focus in intentionality and responsibility. Solomon was responsible for the choices he made to turn away from you. We're responsible for the media, social interaction, desires that we choose over you. None of them, none of those wives turned his head, our concubines, nothing in our life, lives turns our head away from you. It is an intentional choice that we need to take responsibility for. God, I just ask that you help us with that focus today. That you have given us a new heart as Christians. And that new heart and that new way of thinking and that new way of living should always be turned towards you. 
that we should always be seeking you and keep our eyes on you and keep our feet walking towards that eternal promise. God, help us today to take responsibility for the things that are turning our heads away from you. Hopefully none of us have 700 wives, but I do know we have incredible distractions. However, none of them would be there if we didn't want them to be there. I think about a year ago when I was paying for cable TV and it just got too expensive. That is the real reason why I stopped it. <laughs> And so I had cable turned off, saved $1,200 a year and was really excited by that. But it was amazing to me how much time I actually wasted. And I'm not a person who watches TV a lot, but honestly, there was so much time that I knew I had wasted just sitting in front of the TV or in passing, having to catch different shows, having them on in the background. And how much of that stuff on TV was in my head, was in my heart, and was actually part of the filters that were making decisions for me, not for me, uh, but choosing those decisions. Some of those were forming those decisions based upon this information that was coming in for me from the outside world. Turning off my cable was the best decision I've ever made. Even if I didn't save all that money, it was the best decision. Um, just getting me away from those other types of influences. I wish it had been a little bit more intentional on my part for all the right reasons. But the end result was we need to take responsibility for what is around us. What is turning our head away from you? What is turning our heart away from you? What is, what is taking up our time that is not of the kingdom? God, help us, help us see those because I think some of them are very hidden to us. Unveil those, make those really uncomfortable to us so that we have an idea of what we need to take responsibility for and what we need to work on getting rid of in our lives that are distracting us from the focus you have for us. God, thank you for your faithfulness and allowing us to continually work on our relationship with you and constantly giving us way more grace and mercy than we will ever deserve. In your son's name I pray. Amen.